Okay, all right. Okay, so I would like to welcome everyone to our series of, um, of lectures uh, for, um, this represents our fall program. And uh, it's, first of all, I'd like to thank the, the new National Museum of African American History and Culture for providing funds for this series of our lectures. And uh, basically we are using it as a way to celebrate the opening of the museum as well as touting our own trailblazing 100 years of our national parks. So today we have as a speaker, John Fowler. John is a um, park ranger with the National Park Service. Let me just give you a little brief description about him. He is basically considers himself a public historian. Um, he graduated from University of District of Columbia with a degree in public history, literally, and I'm, and I'm proud to say this, 40 years after I graduated. So he uh, subsequently went to Howard University, received his master's degree in public history um, as well. He, um, he is a prolific writer. He was awarded the 2011 Emerging Public Historian Award. And uh, he is currently writing an um, article, actually probably a book, on his uh, grandfather, Andrew Fowler, who was a um, civil rights activist. Um, today he's going to discuss Carter G. Woodson, uh, who happens to be one of my noted uh, African-American historians. And he's going to uh, discuss the historic site associated with Carter G. Woodson. Generally speaking, many people fail to realize that when they think of the National Park Service, they think of national parks. Well, the National Parks, the National Park Service is also responsible for historic sites, memorials, and there are roughly about 413 areas uh, in the National Park Service inventory. National Park covers about, I think, 84 million acres. What people fail to realize is that among the national, among, in addition to national parks, there are several other um, areas that the National Park Service is, is uh, affiliated with and is responsible for. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. John Fowler. Good afternoon again. I'm glad to see you all out. Thank you again to Mr. Mitchell and the staff for uh, inviting me back. This week, uh, I spoke about the Mary McLeod Council House National Historic Site. And I think I told you that she was probably my most favorite person in history. Well, here's my other most favorite person in history. Dr. Carter G. Woodson. How many people have ever heard of Carter G. Woodson? Okay, good, good, good. Um, as already stated, uh, I'm a park ranger at National Capital Parks East, and I have the pleasure of working at, uh, again, the Mary McLeod Council House National Historic Site and the Carter G. Woodson Home National Historic Site. Now, the Carter G. Woodson Home National Historic Site is unique in that this site is not open to the public yet. So uh, the Bethune Council House serves as a satellite visitor, uh, visitor center. So if you want information on Carter G. Woodson, uh, updates about the restoration and rehabilitation of his house, you would come to the Bethune Council House to receive that information as well as just general information on who Dr. Woodson was. So again, Carter G. Woodson, he is considered to be the father of what we know of black history, African-American history. Um, the Carter G. Woodson Home National Historic Site highlights Dr. Carter G. Woodson's contributions to the nation. Around the turn of the 20th century, as he began his own academic career, Woodson noticed a glaring hole in the educational system in the United States. The public knew very little about the role of African Americans 
um, in American history, and schools were not including African American history in the curriculum. Uh, he worked his entire life to, you know, do away to, to remedy remedy this this action. He exposed the American public and education system to the lives of and history of African Americans and their profound impact on American society through establishing such endeavors as the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History um, and the Associated Publishers Incorporated, starting the Negro History Bulletin and the Journal of Negro History, um, and also Negro History Week in 1926. We'll talk a little bit more about those endeavors in a few minutes. Carter G. Woodson was born December 19th, 1875 in New Canton, Virginia. Um, like Mrs. Bethune, born uh, during this period in American history known as Reconstruction, um, the son of people who had been enslaved. As an African-American boy growing up in Central Virginia during the late 19th century, Woodson had very few educational opportunities, um, as well as employment opportunities. During this time period, his family relocated to Huntington, West Virginia, to work in the coal mines there. Um, so Woodson and, and some of his family work in those coal mines, and it's not until he's 20 years old that he's able to get the chance to go to school to receive an education. He receives his high school diploma in just two years. He then goes on to receive uh, his bachelor's degree from Berea College in Berea, Kentucky. And he was very intelligent. He had a this, this natural desire, like Mrs. Bethune again from last week, this desire to learn, this thirst for education. But also he had a desire to learn more about his people. Uh, African Americans and their role in American society. So he graduates from Berea. He then goes to the University of Chicago. During this time period, the University of Chicago was uh, is deemed as the Harvard of the Midwest. So he goes to the University of Chicago and not only earns another bachelor's degree, but also a master's degree. He enters Harvard University. And in 1912, Carter G. Woodson becomes the second African-American to earn a PhD from Harvard University. Who was the first? I think I say it on here, yeah, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, however, Woodson is the first and only African-American of slave parentage to earn a PhD. So we like to make that distinction. Um, but again, Woodson is the, he's the first um, African-American to earn a PhD in history from Harvard. So at this time period, Woodson is the first African American uh, to be a professionally trained historian in the United States. Very significant. Uh, in 1915, by this time, he's, uh, he's finished Harvard. He's teaching at various places. Um, not only in the District of Columbia and outside the U.S., um, but he's uh, also endeavoring again to, to, to remedy the role of African Americans um, in American society, the information that exists. 1915 is a very significant year. 1915, the film Birth of a Nation is released, uh, depicting African Americans in um, stereotypical roles, 1915 is also the 50th anniversary of uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, abolishment of slavery. Um, but it's also in this year that Woodson decides, because of uh, birth of a nation and these other things affecting African Americans and people of African descent, trying to change the narrative, he decides to create his own organization, he and others, um, the Association for the Study of Negro life and history. Today, this organization is now known as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, the organization aims to inform the American public of the contributions of African Americans in the or in the formation 
uh, of this country, its history and culture. Uh, his organization, like Mrs. Bethune, was headquartered at his house, 1538 9th Street, uh, Northwest Washington. Dr. Woodson uh, resided on the second floor and uh, the rest of the house basically served as headquarters for Asala, that's what the organization is called now, the acronym, and uh, his publishing company. This slide here has images uh, documenting the Journal of Negro History, the Negro History Bulletin, and uh, a letter. Um, the Journal of Negro History, very important. Um, the Journal of Negro History is the first scholarly published journal uh, created by and specifically dealing with um, African American history. Actually, we're celebrating the centennial of this, uh, this journal. I don't know why this keeps on doing that. Um, teacher, she felt that there needed to be some type of, uh, some type of material for school teachers, for students. So she um, had Dr. Woodson to create the Negro History Bulletin. So this is the first, time, the first time in the nation's history that you have these type of curriculum based instruments uh, disseminated throughout the country to uh, teachers in the public school system. This letter um, is an example of letters that were sent all over the country from Dr. Woodson um, at the organization's headquarters uh, requesting that people get involved in uh, his organization, ASAPA, uh, requesting that they get, they get an interest in Amer uh, African American history, which is American history, um, give back to ASAPA, support his program, support, uh, you know, give funds. These are just some of the people who inhabited it or who came to uh, 1538 9th Street for a period of time. Um, both Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, two of the uh, well-known figures, literary figures of the Harlem Renaissance, both worked for Dr. Woodson there in that home. Zora Neale Hurston was a uh, yeah, researcher for Dr. Woodson and uh, Langston Hughes he kind of perform, performed various functions uh, for Dr. Woodson and the association. Um, anything from sweeping floors, uh, preparing books, um, doing mail outs of information, things of that nature. These other uh, people, of course, you've got Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, her house is right around the corner from uh, Dr. Woodson. Mrs. Bethune served as the first female president of his organization. Um, the longest serving uh, president of the organization, bringing a lot of prestige and money to the organization. Um, one of the great things that I like to mention in reference to Mrs. Bethune, even though she herself was an educator, like most uh, Americans, she did not know uh, as much as she should have known about the contributions and achievements of African, people of African descent. So meeting Dr. Woodson and working intimately with him and the organization enhanced her understanding. So she was able to, um, as she you know, re you know, uh, received and went to higher heights, she would disseminate this history throughout her speeches and things. So that's very important. When you um, learn something, you, should, you are supposed to you know, share it and pass it along uh, to other people. Another aspect to Dr. Woodson and his, uh, I guess, empire, if you will, um, the Associated Publishers Incorporated. This was a publishing company. During this time period in America's history, they were not publishing the scholarship of African Americans. Um, they weren't publishing the scholarship of some Jewish Americans, women. Well, Dr. Woodson literally created his own publishing company and had it headquartered in his home um, to get the works of these types of people published. So he literally had a printing press in his house, uh, I believe it was located in the basement, and he would make books. He would, uh, the, these authors would bring their work 
to the uh, to him there at the house, and he would you know do the the the, the, the printing and things, and he would make books, and he would uh, prepare the books and package them, and you know he would have either him he himself or his agents. They would go about uh, Washington, the country, uh, probably the world, and sell these books, um, sell these uh, these uh, pieces of information. Uh, Dr. Woodson not only dealt with scholarly works, but he also dealt with children's literature, juvenile literature, as you can see with this picture poetry book. Um, he uh, sought out uh, uh, illustrators uh, who were African American to uh, you know, draw and, and, and things for these books. This is the first time again that you've got uh, someone of African descent uh, trying to reach out and gain get support from other African Americans who do these types of things, drawing these types of pictures for children. It's very significant. And as you can see, that's the house, 1538 9th Street, um, where Dr. Woodson lived and his organization uh, was headquartered. There used to be a sign outside the house that says the Associated Publishers. Negro History Week. Uh, a lot of people, uh, they say uh, that they gave us the shortest month of the year. They gave us. And that is just not a true statement. Um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson in 1926 um, selected the month of February, in the, I believe the, the week of Abraham Lincoln's birthday and uh, Abraham Lincoln's birthday, Abraham Lincoln's birthday and Frederick Douglass's birthday to honor the contributions of people of African descent in the United States. Um, he strategically selected uh, that week again for Lincoln and Douglass because um, by this time, since President Lincoln's death, African Americans had been celebrating uh, Lincoln's birthday. People had been celebrating Douglas's birthday. They held celebrations all over the country in certain black communities. So he strategically selected this week to honor the contributions of African Americans. The idea was to learn um, about African American history um, and you select certain topics, certain things that you learn and you would come back and talk about what you learned. Um, not only relegating the history the learning of this history to this this week, but eventually the idea was for it to to last to learn you learn every day of the year, and that week in February was just when you would come back and uh, basically give a summarization of what you learned. Um, in 1976, the week was expanded into an entire month, and then you know renamed or called Black History Month. So we still celebrate it. And this is probably Dr. Woodson's most important contribution um, to American history. Classrooms all over the country, churches, civic centers, organizations celebrated Negro History Week. As already stated, um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson was an educator. Um, some of the places that he taught, um, well, as he ran his organization, he sought out other educational uh, and uh, you know financial opportunities in the ac academic world, teaching at both the collegiate uh, and public school level, um, training researchers and other staff, writing books and articles on subjects. This was his life's work. Um, if you were to come to Dr. Woodson's house, you would just see books galore. Dr. Woodson was a bibliophile, so he collected books. He loved books. Um, he would, uh, his, his collection was, was massive there in the house. Um, Dr. Woodson held the position of the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts at Howard University, and he's also um, the one who, uh, who started the history department there at Howard University. Well, not, not started the history department, but started graduate level, level courses there at Howard. 
um, from 1919 to 1920. He served as the Dean of West Virginia Collegiate Institute, now known as West Virginia College, say college, um, and he was well respected and sought after here in the DC public school system, serving as a teacher and principal at Armstrong High School, Dunbar High School, um, well, it was called M Street High School back then. But in 1922, he retired from teaching um, and gave his full attention to Asala. This was his life's work. Um, Dr. Woodson would literally give all of his money to uh, this cause, to Asala. Um, so much so that when he dies in 1950, you know, he has nothing, he has no money, no, uh, nothing to leave. He, you know, willed everything to the organization. This slide here um, just highlights some of the things that um, we are doing as the National Park Service in trying to gain momentum and bring about awareness to Dr. Woodson and his home. Um, as already stated, uh, he died, Dr. Woodson died April 3rd, 1950. Um, he leaves the home to Asala um, and they stay in the home and by the mid-70s, Asala abandons the property for various reasons. And so the home is, uh, you know, empty, dormant for about a good 25 years. And it's not until the early 90s that uh, the home is, uh, attention is brought to the home. It's actually Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton that introduces the legislation in Congress uh, asking the Park Service to take over the home. And it doesn't come into the Park Service until 2006. Um, the Carter G. Woodson home is the 389th unit of the National Park System. Um, it was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1976, a National Historic Site in 2003. Every year on December 19th, we celebrate Dr. Woodson's birthday at Shallow Baptist Church, um, located um, right there on 9th Street, just a few doors down from Dr. Woodson's home. Dr. Woodson was a member of Shiloh. In fact, a lot of his uh, work uh, was on the black church, the role of the black church in American history. Um, so it's very fitting that we um, partner with Shiloh uh, for this event. Um, some of our other partners include the um, uh, Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Dr. Woodson was a member of this fraternity. Um, of course, we're partners with the Woodson family. Dr. Woodson never married and did not have children. He literally, again, devoted all of his time and attention to Asala. Uh, but we do work with descendants of Woodson, um, great, great, great uh, nieces and nephews. Um, every year, the Park Service uh, hosts or gets interns from various colleges, uh, HBCUs across the country. And these interns come to Washington and they learn and work uh, about Mrs. Bethune and Carter G. Woodson and their contributions. These interns are called the Woodson Scholars. So the interns that you see on this slide, this was our first, I guess, inaugural class. We started this in about 2014. Um, students from Howard, uh, from Savannah State University, from North Carolina Central, uh, Lafayette College, you name it. We reach out to these schools through partnerships with the Greening Youth Foundation and their Historically Black Colleges uh, Initiative, um, the Student Conservation Association. You know, to do work and research on Dr. Woodson, on Mrs. Bethune, to um, train them on how to give tours of historic homes, teaching them about historic preservation, going to uh, archives and uh, other repositories, learning about learning the differences between what a primary source is, a secondary source, things of that nature. Um, still, again, in line with the Woodson legacy, teaching and passing on this information to the next generation. Uh, Carter G. Woodson Park, Rhode Island Avenue. This is probably one of the newest parks here in DC, um, right a few doors from uh, the Woodson home. If you haven't seen it, go by. It's a beautiful little park. Um, you can even take a picture with Dr. Woodson, like I did there at the bottom. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, uh, 
I believe at some point, don't quote me, but I believe at some point, um, the Park Service is supposed to acquire this park from DC and it will become, you know, kind of a part of the um, National Historic Site. Um, so that's always great. And this slide just highlights or showcases uh, the work that is being done or that has been done on the home. Um, the Park Service not only purchased his home, 1538, but it also purchased the two adjacent properties, 1540 and 1542. All of the homes need uh, significant amounts of work done. Dr. Woodson's home and uh, the second home, 1540, the home where the wood bracing is uh, received uh, very, very bad damage during the earthquake back in 2011. Um, in fact, the wall, the rear wall in the back of the home um, actually collapsed. So that um, has caused us a lot of time and money in trying to get the home actually open to the public. Um, but they are working. Um, I drove by a few, probably about a week or so ago, and I did see contractors out there working. We're hoping for the home to be open early next year. So please keep your fingers crossed. Um, but it's exciting. Um, the idea is for it to be just as if Dr. Woodson and Asala were there in the house. And these are just selected books authored or co-authored by Dr. Woodson. Again, Dr. Woodson, he wrote many books, many articles, served as a, a contributor to uh, various newspapers throughout the country. Um, his, again, library collection is vast. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to do, since a lot of his books and things are out of print, we're hoping that once the site is open, we can enter into some type of partnership with Asala, because Asala, they, they owned his publishing company, uh, maybe trying to bring back some of those that are no longer in print and, and possibly, you know, sell them in the gift shop. I mean, these are valuable classic books. Dr. Woodson's most famous book, published in 1933, is The Miseducation of the Negro. Um, that's considered required reading um, in most African American history classes, along with Up From Slavery by uh, Booker T. Washington and The Souls of Black Folk by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Those three books are considered required reading um, in African-American history. And that uh, completes the presentation. Um, I did want to mention, uh, in addition to the books and things that Dr. Woodson collected, uh, he also preserved uh, various artifacts. And these artifacts may not be what you consider uh, what you think of as artifacts, but primary source documents, um, primary source of documents or materials that scholars collect um, to write books and journals and articles, and secondary sources are these books, journals, articles, monographs, things of that nature. Dr. Woodson would actually go around and collect these, uh, these documents, uh, papers, institutional papers, uh, personal papers, uh, maybe libraries from uh, well-known famous people, and he would store them and try his best to preserve them. And again, a lot of that collection was in this home at 1538 9th Street. Thank you. So her question was, what is the insight going to look like when we're done? Um, to be honest with you, uh, to my knowledge and understanding, um, there is not that much in terms of uh, artifacts um, of Dr. Woodson, of the organization. I do know that Asala, they um, 
gave their collection to Emory University. And that collection is actually, was Dr. Woodson's uh, library. So Dr. Woodson's collection is at Emory University. Uh, uh, Howe University has a, a collection of Dr. on Dr. Woodson. Um, Boone State has a collection on Dr. Woodson. Library of Congress um, have collections on Dr. Woodson. So, you know, there, there is information out there. In reference to what will actually go in the house, there will be exhibits and things um, there in the house. Um, it may not be there when we first open up, give us some time, but the plan is just to get people in the actual house um, since it has been so long, such a, a long time coming. Uh, but again, exhibits and other interpretive materials. Um, and you know, we may be able to get some things on loan, period pieces, things of that nature. Um, but again, in terms of artifacts, um, there aren't that many artifacts due to uh, his collection being at various repositories. All right, thank you. I just wanted to thank you for an awesome and informative presentation. And do you have a uh, GoFundMe or crowdsourcing campaign so that we can help get this building open and also um, will there be like an active research center where we can go in and do our own research similar to the Holocaust Museum. You can go in, there's libraries and research and I would love to be able to take the artifacts that I have and try to match it up with what he had and see what we can do to uh, engage the community. I think it would be a wonderful resource to include something like that, and I'd be happy to donate funds if you have a, a site. Thank you. Thank you. Her question was, is there like a GoFund uh, someplace where the public can donate uh, to the home? There is not, but we do welcome, uh, you know, donations, you know, being federal government, you know, you have to be careful on, you know, that type of thing. Um, but um, through our partners, um, through Asala, Asala, you know, become a member of Asala, donate, um, various other uh, partners. Um, we do partner with them and they, you know, with their help, their resources, we have been able to, you know, speed along um, with the restoration and rehabilitation of the house. Um, we are in talks or in the planning stages now in terms of um, exhibits, interpretive materials, um, and what you stated about a place where uh, people, young people can come and do research. Um, we have been talking about that, trying to come up with different ways to draw people, to particularly young people, um, to the historic site. That area, the Shaw neighborhood, um, historically has been a very vibrant, um, and cultured community, not just for African Americans, but all people who inhabit it. So we still want to draw on that once the historic site opens. So yes, we are working on that. Any other questions? The lady in the back. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, my question, I might have missed it, but um, the teaching materials that were created, the brochure, what grade, what grade were that for? And um, what happened? Because I didn't learn any of this in school. So, thank you. Um, the materials, uh, the of course, the Journal of Negro History, mostly for, you know, collegiate level graduate studies, um, or people who are just interested um, in history. That's one of the great things about ASALA. ASALA is not only an organization for historians and, uh, you know, people who are, you know, 
the greed, but it's for the regular person, people who just have genuine interest in history, um, American history, history of the African diaspora. Um, the Negro History Bulletin, that these, you know, these things are still being published. Um, now, no, now it's called the Black History, uh, the Black History Bulletin. Um, these things are still being published. They publish these things on all uh, levels for all uh, grades, um, middle school, elementary school, high school, um, various lesson plans. Asala uh, actually sets the theme. There's a theme every year for Black History Month, and Asala sets the theme. And Asala makes these teachers' kits and things, um, so you can go to their website and find out how to get some of these um, these kits and, and learning materials. Um, but it is very much out there. Uh, the only thing I can say in terms of, you know, why you didn't learn it in school, um, unfortunately, there's still a, a pervasive uh, amount of information as relates to uh, certain aspects of American history that is not known. That's one of the things that we, um, the Park Service, um, the Postal Museum, I'm sure, trying to eradicate, you know, going out into the school system, um, going to these schools, working with the students and teachers, teaching them these things, having public programs such as this. You just answered it, actually. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's good. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to mention, is that, uh, and I wrote this down, it was a question um, that I was asked. I want to write it down, because it, it's sort of in line of what she said in my response, um, you know, in terms of uh, history and its role. I think Woodson would argue that all history is important, and again, it's up to us to make sure that we, you know, chronicle this history, that we go out and research it, and that we pass it along to our children and future generations so it will not be lost, um, and to preserve it. In light of the Park Service's centennial, um, you know, where Asala just celebrated 100, 100 years last year, um, the, the opening of the new Smithsonian Museum, I mean, just all of these great things that we're celebrating, a lot of it could not have uh, happened without people like Carter G. Woodson, uh, people like Mary McLeod Bethune, these, these often unsung heroes in history. So, any other questions? Before you leave, I wanted to ask you this. I didn't realize that he had published, he had his own publishing company. Yes. Okay, so he was associated with uh, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston who were distinguished authors in their own right. Did he publish any of their material? So I'm not sure about Zornel Hurston, but I know he did publish a few of Langton Hughes' work, uh, uh, earliest, some of his earliest pieces. And remember, this is Woodson, uh, Woodson employs Hughes sort of uh, right before the cusp of uh, you know his 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 career his literary career taking off, but I do believe he did um, uh, publish a few of his early pieces of writing. Any other questions? Well, thank you all. You've been a great audience. We have brochures and things on the table for you to take. I just want to mention that next week we'll have a park service ranger from the. Frederick Douglass Historic Site. So please, I hope that you guys will be attending as well. All right, thank you.